Man, I'll be honest. Uh, it was really hard to try and figure out what to speak tonight because my mind's been in a lot of different places. And uh, even in prayer, I couldn't really uh, come up with a clear picture of what God wanted me to speak to you all tonight. But I had an idea, and it was kind of in the midst, and I had some things written out from weeks ago that I tried to pull out, put together, and all that different kind of stuff uh, to help you all. But I know really with the direction God's leading me um, tonight. Uh, who's here Sunday night? I know there's only, it was about seven, a few people. Um, Sunday night, if you follow our Instagram page, Trent, so is you. Um, you saw that on Sunday night, the students that were here uh, wrote out their testimony. You got a big old loose leaf paper that I gave to them. They uh, wrote out their testimony, wrote out their story. Uh, and the reason they did that is because in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 11, it says that the saints overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Okay? Now we know what the blood of the Lamb is. That's the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for us. When he, when he died for our sins, when He took our place, we should have been the ones on the cross. When He took our place and died for our sins, that's the blood of the Lamb. That's the blood of Jesus that has covered all our sins and has made us new. Okay, But then they bring up this other thing. So we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb. But this other thing that we as Christians can overcome by is by the word of our testimony. Now what is a testimony? A testimony is really not your story. It's God's story in you. It's really the story of God in your life. Not your story about your life. Not your testimony about who you are and what you've come through. It's about God. Okay, Your testimony, it's, it's all pointed towards God and what He's done in your life because no glory should be given to you. So your testimony matters. What God has done in your life is important. What God is continuing to do in your life is important. And if there's any great weapon against the enemy because the context of that verse when he said we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of testimony, he was talking about overcoming the devil, overcoming the evil powers in this world, the darkness, that the two best ways, the best ways that we as Christians can overcome those things is by the blood of the Lamb, which we didn't do ourselves. Jesus shed his blood for us. That's how we overcome that. But the other thing he said is the word of our testimony, your story, the story of God in you. The story of what God's done in your life is one of the greatest weapons you have against the power of darkness in this world, against evil, against all the forces of temptation and, and, and darkness that come against you at school, at work, at home, wherever it is, the greatest weapon you have against that, one of the greatest weapons you have against it is what God has already done in you. And the word of your testimony, the word of what God has done in your heart, in your life, in your mind, and how He's changed you and brought you through many things, okay? So... It's important that people know God's story in you. Not your story, God's story in you. See, in Acts chapter 21, 22, in that area, Paul is about to preach to a bunch of people in Jerusalem. Okay? And he gets up on, on, in front of everybody in the Temple Mount and he says, All right, here's my defense of the gospel. Here's my, here's my defense of what I believe. And of Jesus as Savior. And you know what his defense was? It wasn't some theological argument of this is why Jesus had to die on the cross. It wasn't some explanation of why you need to be a Christian. It wasn't some explanation of how to live a good life. Paul's defense of who God was, who he is, and what he could do was his own story. See, Paul, in front of all those people, told his story of what had happened in his life. And what God had done in his heart. And if you know the story of Paul, he started out killing Christians. He started out going after people like you and me that professed to believe in Jesus. And he would go and he would kill them. They didn't like those people. I mean, they don't like them nowadays. But he did not like Christians. He did not want Christians around. They were seen as a plague or a virus in, in the very um, network uh, of the world. And so Paul was going to different places, ordering their destruction, ordering them to be killed, martyring them. And so Paul is on the road to this place called Damascus, going to arrest and kill Christians there. And on his way, he has a vision from the Lord. The Lord comes to him in this vision, and he's, he's knocked off his, I don't know if it was a donkey, I think it says donkey, but regardless. He, he's knocked off his, his animal, and he, he sees this bright light, and he doesn't know, and he says, you know, who is this? What, what's going on? And God says, 
Paul, Paul, why have you, well, he says Saul, because at the time his name was Saul. Saul, Saul, why have you forsaken me? Which means, why have you forgotten me? Why have you turned your back on me? Because, see, the thing about Paul was that he actually already believed in God. You know that, like, Paul believed in the God of the Old Testament, right? The first portion of the Bible, he believed in the God that, that created, that Moses part of the Red Sea, and, and he believed in the God that saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. He, he believed in the God that set down the law and spoke through the prophets. But what he didn't recognize is that Jesus was the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament. What he didn't recognize is that Jesus was God come in the flesh. And because he didn't recognize that, even though he believed in God... He did not have a full understanding of him. And that's why God said, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forgotten me? Why have you put me on the side? And why, why, why can't you see who I am? Why can't you realize that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the stuff you believe? And so, Paul has this vision. He, he turns out he's blinded by this vision. He goes into the city and this man named Ananias prays for him as God leads him and, and heals him. And then he's, Paul is baptized and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. And he begins preaching immediately, it says in Acts. Immediately he begins preaching. He can't help but tell people about what God has done in his life. Because one day he was a murderer. One day he was somebody that was killing Christians. And the next day, what was it? He was a Christian himself. He was the kind of person that he used to be killing. And that's a pretty radical change for someone to go from, from being a murderer of Christians to being a Christian himself. Talk about a life change. Talk, the, the complete opposite, the complete thing that he used to hate is what he turned into. Because God had done something in his life. And God had truly impacted him. And so when Paul preached the gospel to the people in Jerusalem, he couldn't help but tell them, here's how I know God is real. Here's how I know that Jesus is the Christ. is because of what he did in my life. See, there's a lot of people out there that don't believe in God. And we can give them all the arguments in the world as to why God exists. We can give them these ontological arguments, as they call it, as to why the universe had to be created by God, or how God does exist, and how we know He's real. And we can go all these arguments and explanations, and yet the reality is, is that the best defense you have for who Jesus is, who God is, for what He can do in someone else's life is what He's done in yours. And what He continues to do in your life. That's the best defense you have. About two months ago, we took a trip. Some of you were on it to this, uh, in Salina. And it was this uh, event called God's Graffiti. Okay? And if you all remember, those of you that were there, my dad spoke that morning and he told his testimony. He shared about how, where he had been in life before and where God brought him to and how God saved him and how God turned his life around. And there was a young man there at God's Graffiti that was an atheist. Okay, he didn't believe in God, but he was there because he had a girlfriend that was present at the meeting, at the conference. Okay, this young man got saved that day. Now understand, this man didn't, this kid didn't believe in God. This kid didn't, he, he thought that God was just a fairy tale, didn't exist, there was no way a God could exist. But simply somebody's story of what God had done in their life was powerful enough for him to recognize that God must be real. He didn't need any arguments or explanations presented to him. All he needed was a representation of what God can do and has done in someone else's life. That was all he needed. That was the best defense of the gospel. You really want to see your friends come to church, be a part, get saved, end up in heaven one day? Tell them what God has done in your life. Because you can come up with any argument, you can come up with any explanation, but you know why you believe in God. And I'd say for most of you, it's because you've experienced Him. It's not just because you were raised in church and it's in your head. It's because you've had some sort of experience. Maybe it was here. Maybe it was at another church. It was at church camp, convention, some sort of conference, or just some other service somewhere. But you've had experience with God at some point, and that's why you still believe in who He is and what He can do today. So your story, God's story in you, matters. Your testimony of who God is and what He can do matters. There's a song, I, I shared it, I, I shared it on, um, on Sunday night, and I'll probably share it again here in a few minutes tonight, but it's by Lecrae, if you've ever heard of Good, Bad, and Ugly. Um, and it tells his testimony, it tells his story of where he was and the things that had happened in his life. See, all of us, and, and my eyes have been open to some things recently. Um, just through different different things that have happened in my life, people that have come into it, uh, different. My eyes have been open to some things that I hadn't realized before, and I hadn't sought after before, and I hadn't understood before. And yet, God's God's allowed me to see those things. And one of the things that so many young people are chasing for in this life is their identity. Right? You're trying to figure out who you are, and you can look for your identity in a lot of things. You can look for your identity in a girlfriend or a boyfriend. 
as in another person. You can try and find your identity in your family. You can try and find your identity in something that you do, like the sports you play or the job you want to have one day, the career, maybe the work you do right now, the friends you have at school. Maybe you try and find your identity in your score. You try and find your identity in maybe something like drugs or sex or, or, or alcohol, any of those kinds of things. You can try and find your identity because you're trying to find who you are and you're trying to find out what it is inside. You've got this itch. You know there's something more to life. You want there to be something more to life. But you don't know exactly how to scratch that itch. You don't know what's the best thing to use. What's the best thing to call upon to recognize what you need. You, we don't recognize what we need in our life. That's where a lot of young people are at. And that's why some people end up at this place where they have suicidal thoughts or they're caught in depression. Because they don't understand all the things of life because they quite haven't figured out their identity. So many people are trying to find their identity in so many things instead of in God. Let me explain. So you know the story of this guy named Peter. Okay? He was a great friend of Jesus. Okay? Spent three years with Jesus. Followed him around everywhere. Believed everything Jesus had to say. And then some of you know the story. Jesus gets betrayed. He's going to be crucified. And Jesus, before he got betrayed, and before he was ready to be crucified, he told Peter, you know what? Peter had come to him and said, Jesus, I'll die with you. Like, I'll, I'll go into the line with you. I'm, I'm going to make it with you. I'm not going to let this happen to you. And Jesus said... Before the rooster crows, three times, you will have, you, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. And as you know the story, that night that Jesus was basically in court, and they were trying to accuse him of some things, Peter was standing outside, he was waiting. And three different times, people come up to him and they're like, you're that guy that hung around with this, this guy, and you're the guy that hung around with Jesus. Like the guy that's on trial right now, you hung around with him. And you know what his answer to the first person was? No, that's not me. That's not, you have me mixed up. You think of somebody else. Somebody else comes to him a second time and says, P you've got, you're that Peter guy, right? You're the, you're the guy that's always, every time I've seen Jesus, you've been with him. He's not. Nah, that's not me. And that first person comes up again and it's like, it's, it's got to be you. Don't be, be lying. Like, it's got to be you. I know that you're the man that's been following Jesus around and is always with him. Peter says, no, no, and immediately, as it says in Scripture, the rooster crowed, and he realized what he had done. He had just denied Jesus. So the reality was is that Peter didn't want to be identified with Jesus. I mean, and why would you want to be on a night like that, right? I mean, Jesus is going to be killed in one of the worst ways possible, right? Death on a cross is a lot worse than getting shot in the head. It just really is, okay? It's torture. They hang you on a tree. They nail through your hands and your feet, well, through your wrists, really, and through your feet, okay? And you're bleeding out. And, the, and, and actually, the way they prop you up is in such a way that every time you breathe, it hurts because you have to lift yourself up on the nails to breathe. And then they put a crown of thorns on Jesus' head, so he's bleeding from the head down. And most people would hang there for days at a time before they died. It was absolute torture to hang on a cross. Why would you want to identify with a guy that was about to be killed in that way? Why would you want to be identified with a guy who was about to go to the whipping post, which meant they'd take a cat of nine tails, which basically was a whip that had a bunch of iron and metal and scraps and, and, and broken pieces of metal on the ends of it, and they would whip you with it, and it would literally tear the back of your skin out. Why would you want to be identified? Like, like who can blame Peter, right? Like, come on. Like, it, Jesus is being killed. Why would you want to say, I'm a part of that guy's tribe too? Because that means you're going in with him. That means you're going to die with him. You're going to have to endure that torture. And the problem was, Peter had spent three years with Jesus, and he still hadn't found his identity in Jesus. Peter had been with him for three years, fought around, seen him do miracles, and yet he didn't want to be identified with the man. He said, I don't want a part of that. Right? And, and really, who you identify with kind of determines your identity. They always say that, like, who you hang with will determine who you become. Like, who you're around, if you're around negative friends, you're going to end up being negative, unless you're, like, the influence, and most of the time, you aren't. Even if the influence is somebody else, the people that you hang around, that you look up to, is who you're going to become. Like or your family, or whoever it is. So you become like the people you're around. You find your identity in the people you're around, in the things you're around. And Peter, after three years with Jesus, still hadn't found his identity in Jesus. He hadn't found his identity in who God was right in front of him. And see, he figured it out eventually, I'm glad to say. But the reality is that many of us are yet to find our identity in Jesus. And if it was so hard for Peter, I can't imagine it being anything but hard for us, right? Because Peter actually got to walk with the man face to face, see him do miracles right in front of him. Like, and, and yet, 
we haven't been able to see him face to face in that way. So I can see why maybe it'd be a little bit harder to identify with Jesus. It took Peter three years to recognize the need to identify himself with Jesus and to be identified by Jesus and who he is and who he was. And many of us tonight are trying to find our identity in a lot of other people or a lot of other things in this life. Peter knew there was something more to his life than what he was getting. He knew that and that he wouldn't have followed Jesus if he thought otherwise. He followed Jesus because he knew there was something about this guy that could give him that which his heart desired. And see, C.S. Lewis is the guy that said, this is a rough paraphrase of what he said, but he basically said, the fact that nothing in this world can satisfy my desire. Like, I can't get any, I, I don't know what it is, but there's something about me that I desire something that this world can't give me. It must mean I was made for another world. I'm talking about heaven. Right? There's something that only God can give you. There's, there's a, a piece of your heart that only God can fill. There's, think about it. God created you. In reality, He's the only one that can recreate you. No one else can. So tonight I'm asking you to find your identity in Jesus. I'm asking you to find who Jesus is in you. Because He has a story to tell, not about you, but about Him in your life. And that's where your identity is to be placed. Not in other things. Not in other people. Not in other situations. God is who He says He is. And He wants to have a story in you. And He's already been working in ways, maybe ways you've recognized at this point, maybe ways you haven't. He's already been working in your life in ways to lead you to Him. To guide you onto a path where you would recognize who He is and you could find your identity in Him and in nothing else. You could realize who you are. See, Jesus also said that at the judgment seat, it's, it's only those who do the will of the Father that get into heaven. So if we don't find our identity in Jesus, really we're, we're, we're trending on, on, on thin waters. Because if we don't find our identity in Jesus, we aren't going to do what He says. We aren't going to act as He would have us to act. But if we do find our identity in Jesus, we will do everything He's called us to do and we will live the life He's called us to live. And therefore, one day we can be with Him forever. See, everybody in here has got a story. And it's important that someone knows it. Not just you. It's important that someone recognizes that God has done something in every one of your lives. Whether you're a Christian or not, He's already worked. He's already worked in your heart. And if you take a look, maybe you recognize how He had done it. Maybe you'd recognize what he had done in your life. I'm going to show you all this video real quick. I know I showed it on Sunday night, but it's, it's kind of a lyric video to, the, to this song um, by Lecrae called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And it's kind of his story, his testimony. And it's kind of cutting. It's kind of deep, to be honest. It's kind of, it's kind of rough, really, what he says. And some of this stuff may speak to you about your situation and where you've been and where God's brought you from. And you may recognize and realize what he has done in your life. Let me get past this ad real quick. Don't you all just love ads? Wow. Really quickly, I, I, listen, I want every one of you to watch this video. It's just a lyric video, but I want you to read the lyrics that are up as he sings them and recognize what he is saying in his story and in his testimony right here of the things that have happened in his life and what God's brought him from, okay? So just watch this video real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Watch out for strangers. Keep my eyes peeled for danger. Folks working late. I had a babysitter. I ain't about to sit here and neighbor. I was on the stake. Came in late. Woke me up. Gave me play. Did a few things that's hard to say. Told me to keep that secret safe. Now how a young boy's supposed to deal. Trying to act like it ain't real. Got my innocence just stripped from me. And I still don't know how to feel. And I'm wondering how to address it. Can't tell my family to mess it. So I just embrace it. It's hard to face it. I'm too ashamed to confess it. So I kept it in and they speak. Well, I got promiscuous and only God can help me get free But I've been forgiven, my Savior risen I'm out the prison, I know that I got the power to say no to all of my struggles Gotta control that Every time we slip and we fall Gotta get back up and fight on We got not defined by our past The future look bright and see the light on saying in that passage or well not passage but in that song I don't know if you caught on that first part there when I first heard this song it quite got to me and, and to recognize if you, if you really realize what he's saying there he is saying in that first verse that he got a girl pregnant and he was messing around with somebody and got this girl pregnant. If you caught on to what he was saying, he said he decided that it was better that he live without that shame, without that guilt of having had this child in front of everybody. So he decided it was best that he drop his girlfriend or whoever it was off at the abortion clinic and kill the baby because of his pride. Because he didn't want people knowing he messed around before he was married. Or whatever reason he had for not wanting that child in his life. In that second verse, I don't know if you caught on what was happening there, that's even a little bit rougher is to say that a lot of it traces back into his life right before first grade when he had a babysitter that came in and did some things that he said was hard to say. Well, he's talking about being molested. He's talking about somebody that came in and committed sexual acts on him or forced him to do the same thing and he had no idea what they were and he probably still did it for years to come. That takes a toll on something. You want to know why he was probably the way he was with that girl in the future? It was probably because of what happened back then. And nobody, not everybody has that story. Not everybody can say, oh, you know, I was molested. That's why I'm out having sex before marriage and just being, and treating women like objects or maybe even treating men like objects. But the reality is, is he'd been through a very rough patch, multiple rough patches in his life where he had no God in him and therefore the situations he endured, the things he went through were overwhelming and destroyed his very character, destroyed his very life. And as you saw at the end, he says, you know, I've been saved from that. I've been freed from that. My Savior has taken a hold of me. I'm a new person now. It's not the same anymore. But see, the reality is that many of you, almost all of you, if not all of you in this room, have dealt with situations in your life or something going on in your life right now that's a little too hard to bear. And you're wearing the mask pretty well. You know, there's a lot of kids you walk by every day. There's probably kids in here that have been raped and molested and you wouldn't know it if it happened the night before. You wouldn't know it if it happened that very night before you saw them or if it was going to happen right after they left. Because so many of us wear the mask so well of being all right. And so many of us wear this mask well of everything's going fine. My life is as it should be. We, we, we hold on to our pride and we don't let people know the kind of stuff that's going on. Maybe it's out of fear. I mean, I'm sure some people that have been raped or molested out of fear of the person that did it to them never told anybody. They feared for their life or they feared for their family or they feared for something. There's people out there that Maybe even claim to be Christians that they wear the mask well. And they'll get drunk this weekend, but you won't know it on Sunday. You won't know it next Wednesday when they come to youth group and, and lift their hands in worship. There's some young people out there 
that are hooked on drugs, but not on Sunday, not on Wednesday. You wouldn't know. Maybe not even during the week at school. It's only at opportune times where they can get away with those things. It's only at opportune times where they can make these things happen without anybody's knowledge. And then there's some of you in this room that maybe people do know. And maybe people aren't knowledgeable of what you've done or what's been going on in your life. And maybe you care, maybe you don't, whether they know or not. But regardless, I, I dare say that everybody in this room is going through something right now. Every young person in this room is going through something right now that maybe nobody else in the room knows. Maybe nobody else in the room realizes what you're going through. I'm not just talking about sin. See, like I said, God's really opened my eyes to some different things, okay? And, and, and to some compassion and mercy I ought to have on some people. See, I'm going to try and cover a lot of ground in what I'm about to say. There's a lot of you that have been in situations that you didn't want to be in and you failed. And ever since then, you haven't been able to pull yourself out of that pit because you failed the first time. Even though you didn't want to be there, even though you didn't want to do it, even though you didn't want to engage in that action or that behavior or that sin, you knew it was wrong. But because you've already done it once, now your mind tells you, well, you've already done it once, you might as well do it again. And you don't know how to, and maybe you even hate what you're doing. Maybe you even despise the very thought of the things you do. And when you're finished doing them, you think, how could I have done that? How could I have let that happen? How could... But you don't know how to be free from it. You don't know how to come out of that pit. Maybe you're a young girl. And maybe you had this boy that you fell in love with. and But he only saw you as an object. And so he used you in that way. And you engaged in sexual activity with him. Whether, look, whether it was actual sex or something else, oral sex, you sent pictures, whatever, and you regret it now and you know and you wish you had never done it and there's no taking it back, there's no getting away from it, but you've already, done, you've already gone that far. So the next time a guy rolls around, you may go even further. And the same could be said vice versa of guys. Or maybe you're in this room and you're dealing with a situation. Maybe you've got divorced parents and, and you can't stand the thought of it. Maybe there's some hatred there. Maybe there's some anger there. Maybe there's even some depression or some sorrow over the fact that you are living in a home life you didn't want to live in. Or an environment like that. Maybe some of you here are dealing with suicidal thoughts. I don't know. You know, somebody told me, I'm, I don't know if you call it recently, but somebody, somebody shared with me one time how they had fallen into the act of cutting. And when they said that, you know, not a lot of stuff shocks me. I'm a youth pastor. I know what kids do. Okay, I was in high school just a couple years ago. I know what people do. But when they said cutting, I thought, man, who cuts anymore? Because I thought that was kind of like in the past. I thought that was 10, 15 years ago when that was the thing to do when you were depressed. And yet somebody told me that in the last year. I remember thinking, what, what do you mean? I hadn't heard about that in forever. And yet somebody was doing it and nobody knew. I was the only person that ever knew they did that. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's going on in your life that God wants to use for your good, that God wants to step into your situation and not necessarily take you out of, but make you new in it. But I know there's something. Maybe you're in here tonight and you've had maybe a drinking addiction. You took the first sip and you didn't. You thought it's just one, but from there it went even further. And you get drunk on the weekends, you, you engage in this behavior and you don't know how to stop. You hate it. Maybe you even hate the taste of those things, but you can't get free from it because now it's in your mind and you're addicted to things like that. Or maybe something as simple as things like pornography, which is a bigger problem in America today than anybody would like to admit. And, and pornography for both girls and boys that engage in those things. You can get it for free off the internet any place you want. And they engage in these things and they, they, you, you masturbate and do all these things and nobody would ever know. You could get away with it for the rest of your life without anybody ever knowing. I mean, it's really not that hard to do, right? And maybe you hate that. Maybe you hate looking at somebody as an object. and Maybe you hate the fact that every time you look at somebody, your mind goes to that image or your mind goes to that reality or that, that behavior. But you don't know how to be freed from it. You don't know how to come loose from it. You don't know how, how the chains are going to fall off because you've tried hard enough to overcome your guilt and your shame about it, and that didn't work, so you just kept going because you couldn't overcome the addiction either. <clears throat> Maybe some of you in this room have dealt with abuse. Physical abuse, not just sexual abuse. I mean, I mentioned rape and, and molestation earlier. Those things are very real. Maybe you've dealt with that in your life and nobody knows. Maybe you've dealt with physical abuse, sexual abuse, and nobody knows besides the person that abused you. 
Or maybe somebody does, but they haven't spoken up either for you. Or they haven't stood up, and, and, or maybe everybody's kind of had this mutual agreement that we won't talk about it and we won't deal with it. I'm not saying that's not the way to do things, but nobody knows the pain you've been through. And you hold on to that every day, and you walk past everybody, and nobody would know. Nobody would know. We do a very good job of hiding things as you And teenagers especially, I think, do a very good job of hiding the pain they're dealing with, the struggles they're dealing with, the sin they're dealing with, whatever it is in your life that seems to be going wrong, or maybe even in your eyes right, but it shouldn't be going that way, we do a really good job of hiding all those things. We do a really good job of covering ourselves up, hiding behind whoever or whatever to appear okay. But deep down inside, there's somebody that needs to know your story. And maybe right now you've been brought out of that pit. Maybe you're not in that place anymore. Maybe those things happened to you in the past and God's redeemed you and He's made you new and He's given you a new heart. He's given you a new life. But I would also dare say many of you in here have not received that yet. Maybe you've gone to camps, you've gone to conventions, you've gone to youth services, and you've hoped and prayed that God would do something in your life, or you've tried your hardest to change your life after that point, to change what you were doing, or the situation you were in, and yet you still failed to get through all that was going on. And you still failed to move that mountain out of your life, whether it be sin, a situation, any of those things. And you're sitting here today and you're still bound by it. All those things. See, you can still be in a bad situation, but that doesn't mean you're bound by it. You can, you can, you can still be in a situation at home where, where your home life isn't that great, but that does not mean you're bound by it. That does not mean you're in bondage because of it. Most people are, but when they find the freedom that Jesus provides, they can live in that environment again, and they have a whole new heart and a whole new mind, a whole new attitude about everything going on around them. And instead, they are the light now in that situation, and they affect everything that happens around them instead of the opposite. See, that's what's happening to many of you young people. And it's happened to me many times before, and it still happens to this day at various times, that I'm more influenced by the things going on around me, the people around me, than I am the influence I'm called to be as a Christian. And maybe it's because you're in a bad situation. You get abused at home. Or, or, or maybe it's not even that. Maybe you, live, uh, you have a fine family, but you're going out and you're doing all these sinful things because there's pressure around you and there's temptations, and I've done it already, so might as well. What's the worst that can happen? Or as long as nobody finds out. And many of you are dealing with those very things today. And, and you're still in bondage to them. You're still bound by those situations. You're still bound by the, the, those evils. And you're still bound by all the weight of the world that's on your shoulders. I can't imagine. The truth is, I cannot imagine. After I've heard many people's testimonies over the years, and he's opened my eyes even more recently, that I, can't, I really can't imagine what you're going through. I can't be in your shoes and know exactly everything. I don't know your life story. I don't know what all God's done in your life. I don't know what all the devil's done in your life and the enemy has done to tear you apart and break you down. I don't know what all evil things have happened in your life. I don't know all the evil things you've done. But I know this much, is that God wants to have a story in you, and He can change all that, if He hasn't already. See, I, really what happened is I really felt convicted recently that I stand up here and preach all the time against all these things, but I haven't taken the time to really understand and see and have mercy and compassion on those that are struggling in that way. Even though I at times have struggled in that way and didn't know how to be free from the bondage of sin and from the bondage of uh, all these situations. But he showed me there's a, there's a place for compassion. And remember I told this story two weeks ago when I talked about sex sins. And, and I told this story about, there's this woman that had committed adultery. Out, you know, she, she had sex outside of marriage with another man or, or something of the sort. And the Pharisees and all these religious leaders bring her outside the city and they're going to stone her and kill her because that was the law back in the day. And they asked Jesus. They were going to try and catch Jesus in his word. Like, what, what should we do about this, Jesus? I mean... And Jesus says, whoever is without sin should cast the first stone. Meaning, you know, every one of us, every one of those guys out there, and, and maybe ladies that were ready to cast stones on this lady and kill her, they had all committed sin too. Whether it be as major or not as major as what she had done in their eyes, they had all committed sin also. And they were all equally guilty and worthy of death by stoning. And so they begin to cast their stones away. And they recognize what Jesus was saying, that he was right. 
And Jesus picked this lady up. I mean, he didn't like pick her up like that, but like he, he speaks to her and he says, you know, where are your accusers? Like, where are the people that are saying, like, you've done wrong and that are trying to condemn you for it? They're nowhere around. Go and sin no more. See, Jesus is, if you're in a bad situation, if you've committed a sin and you feel the guilt and the shame about it and you know you've done wrong, God is not casting stones at you. God is not a God of condemnation. He, he's a, a God of, of grace and mercy. And if you think that God enjoys the thought of having to cast someone into hell because they are not holy and because they are not saved, He hates the thought of it. He loves everyone and He, he, he wants everyone to be with Him one day and it breaks His heart to have to say, you didn't meet the standards, you weren't holy, I can't be near you. You can't be near me for eternity. He does not enjoy that. He does not appreciate it. He does not hope for it. Although He does it, although He has to judge, although He has to condemn, because we fail, it is of no enjoyment or pleasure to Him to do so. So don't ever believe He wants... God is not casting stones at you. He is not condemning you for the sin you've committed. He's saying, come home. He's saying, change your ways, as He said to the woman. See, He never said, it's okay what you did. He never said that to the woman. He never said, you know what, I, you know, you've had a rough week. It's okay if you kind of did that. Your husband's maybe rough on you, so it's okay that you went out on him. No, he never allowed her, like he never condoned her, and he never said it's okay. But he said, go and sin no more. He said, I'm giving you a chance. You were about to die. I saved you. Now here's your chance to go and change your way so nothing worse happens to you. So that it doesn't happen again. Take this as an opportunity to change. Take this as an opportunity to go and sin no more. See, what I want to do tonight, I've got about 30 index cards here. There's just about 20, uh, I think, well, now 19 teenagers in the room. Um, and what I want to do tonight, and I did this well over a year ago, uh, but I haven't done it in a long time. What I want to do tonight is I want you to, to write some things on this note card. Um, like I said, I, I recognize that I don't really know everybody's story in here, and I don't have to know your story to speak to you. God can give me the right words to say if, if I'll be willing to hear but also the reality is, is that I don't know what you're going through. And because of that, sometimes, maybe I don't have the compassion I ought to have or the mercy. Or I don't chase after you in the way that God's called me to chase after you. And, and it's, it burns in my heart that I need to know what some of you are dealing with. And what some of you are going through that I may have never known the students that I preach to every week face at home or at school or at work every day. It may be something as simple as bullying. It may be abuse. It may be, like I said, maybe your parents are divorced and you just feel some hatred about them. Maybe you're in a bad home life. Or maybe you sin and you know the guilt of it and you know the weight of it. I mean, whatever it is in your life that seems to be going wrong at the moment, whatever it is that you're dealing with, the pain, the weight, the guilt of any of these things, I want you to write it on this note card. And here's the thing. I'm going to give you an option here. Um, I'm going to take these note cards up back up at the end. And you know, last year when I did it, I, had, I kept those note cards for, I mean, months. And I would pull them out of my uh, backpack every once in a while, and I'd just read it. And I would just think, wow, this is what our kids go through. This is what our teenagers go through in today's world. Like, just to be honest with you, I didn't go through a lot of things you all went through. It's just the reality of it. I grew up in a pastor's home where, where both my family, both my parents were, were married, and I was raised in a godly home, and not everybody had that opportunity. And so there's things that you maybe have done or things you've been through that I don't understand, but I want to understand. I want to have mercy and compassion on you in the situations you're dealing with and the things that you're going through. Because, like I said, I just don't fully understand sometimes, but I want to. So I can minister to you most effectively. And this is also a good way for you to get some things out that maybe you haven't put out there before. So like I said, I'll give you an option. You can write your name on this. You don't have to. I'm going to take them all back up. If you want to, I'll, I'll know who you are, and I'll never treat you any differently for anything you say on that. A person that knows that, well, some of the people that know that better than anybody are all these guys over here. You can tell me anything. But then again, like I said, you don't have to put your name on it. If you, if you don't want me knowing that that was Kaylee Overshire that did that, or that was Norman Dufault, or Landon Basham that did that, like, if you don't want me knowing, I understand. You just write it down, hand it to me, whatever. I'll never see your name. But I want you to write what you're dealing with, what you're going through. What's, what's going on in your life right now that you can use prayer for? What sin's casting you down? What sin is breaking your heart and breaking the hearts of others as, as 
maybe things go south in your life, or maybe they don't, but there's just something that you don't understand that's going on in your heart and in your life tonight. I want to know, and I want to be able to pray for you, and I want to be able for you to have a chance to get some things out that maybe you haven't put out there before. And I'll tell you, if you really need to get your feelings out, the best way to do that is to write it. Like sometimes it's not hard to say it. I mean, sometimes it's very hard to say it out to people, but one of the best ways you can do it is to write it. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn on some soft music. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and start it. And as this song plays, as long as you need, take the time, and I want you to come up here and I want you to grab a note card, index card. I've got some pens, I've got some pencils. If yours doesn't work, you can come back. I want you to grab a note card, find a place in the room, and begin to write down what is going on in your life right now that you haven't been able to overcome. What sin is, is, is casting you down, is making you broken, that you haven't been able to get through or to be freed from. And then, like I said, once you're done, just bring it forward. Hand it to me. I, don't, I won't look at it right then, okay? I'll look at these later. So if you don't want me knowing it's yours, that's fine, because I, I won't look at it right now. But I want you to write what you're going through, or what you have been through and what God's brought you through. Did you just you say something? I can talk to you through this stuff. So if you would, just go ahead and come on up. I've got, I've got these cards. Um, you can pass them around. Some pens and some pencils. Find a place in the room. Begin to speak. Uh, write down what all you're going through. Like I said, if you want to put your name on it, you can. You're not, you don't have to. I don't have to ever know it's you. I can just know that somebody that was here tonight needs prayer for this. And needs to be ministered to in this way. Because you are going through things in this life that I may never understand. And that other people may never know. And yet there's a God who understands. There's a God who knows. There's a God who can make it different and make it new. And if there's anything I can do, I can pray for you and I can know what you've been through and how to minister to you in that way. This is your chance to put out there some things maybe you've never said before. Or maybe you have, but you just need your youth pastor to know that somebody in the group is dealing with this. Somebody's going through this. This is the thoughts you're having. This is the guilt you're feeling, the shame you're feeling, or just simply the situation you're in that's overwhelming you in too great a way for you to bear. Amen. 